Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for how you are teaching us and what you are leading us into this period of the conference for your servants. Lord, we are asking that you will keep on teaching us what you know we need in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that you will give us receptive hearts. Amen. That as we receive, our lives will be more conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the churches will be built according to the pattern in your own heart. Amen. Use us for your own glory. Amen. Take all hindrances away from our lives. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to make a slight change in our program. The message on the family life of a busy pastor, I'm going to look into that in the evening time. Uh, I've decided that because, one, if I start on that now, I'm likely to talk until lunch time. And that will remove personal growth for church growth and also mobilizing the saints and the stewards for church growth. And those two messages are very, very important. Uh, therefore, I will not uh, handle the family life of a busy preacher now, but by the grace of God, it will be handled in the evening time, not late evening, uh, just between the time of after resting period, and then before uh, before the supper time. I'll be dealing with danger of compromise in the last days for this period. Then after this message, we'll be having personal growth for church growth. After that, we'll be having mobilizing saints and stewards for church growth, and then after that we'll go and eat, rest, and then come back to continue in the evening. For now, danger of compromise in the last days. We're reading from Matthew chapter 24, from verse 3 to verse 13. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We're talking about danger of compromise in the last days, that is, in the days in which we're living. We are all familiar with seeing danger signs on the roads, in the factory, on the walls of a building with exposed electric wires, or in the papers warning us of health hazards, or warning us of highway robbery. We're familiar with seeing danger signs. And when those danger signs are put there, they're meant to alert us, to warn us, to make us understand and think over again the preciousness of our lives 
And because these things threaten life, because of that, we are warned. If there is danger, we must sound the alarm. We must alert the simple-minded. We must alert the innocent and the ignorant. Every sincere minister that has been called of God to bring people to God and to keep them in the faith. Since God has given his word to people, has always warned God's people of the danger of the days they live. Now, look at that. Moses warned his people. Moses never bothered himself warning the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hittites. He warned his people. You have a ministry to your own people. And when you stand up to, to talk and to expose the dangers in the last days or the dangers of compromise, you are concerned about your people. Joshua warned his own people. And when the kingdom of Israel was divided into two, the northern and the southern, the southern part, the prophets that were raised up, they knew which kingdom they were raised up for. The prophets of Judah, the kings of Judah, they faced and they concentrated on Judah. And uh, the prophets of the other part, of the ten tribes, they concentrated on their people. We too must concentrate on the work God has committed into our hands. Every minister will warn his own congregation of the dangers of the days in which we live. Now, we don't uh, look into the future and speculate of things that have not happened. But the days in which we are living, the dangers that are clearly seen, but which of people who are innocent and simple-minded and ignorant may not know, it's good that we want them. And we want ourselves too. Christ warned his disciples, his apostles, of the dangers in these last days. Think about this. In a city covering flood, when most of the houses in the city have been flooded, and our houses in which we live stand in danger of being flooded. The tenants and the members of the families living in our houses, not yet flooded, but built in the vicinity, in the community of other houses that are already flooded, those tenants and members of the family must be alerted, must be warned. To be quiet about it, when we know already that some houses have been taken over by the flood, some properties have been swept away, some walls have cracked and collapsed, some foundations have been eroded and destroyed, and we know that even though our house today may still be free, but the flood is still making progress. The flood is still coming, and then to fold our hands without any warning, that will be destructive and dangerous to you to anybody in such a situation. You know, at a time when the majority of churches worldwide have been taken over by the spirit of compromise, that is the time we must wake up and sound the alarm and take warning. We are in the last days, and the danger of compromise is very great. Now we're going to see what the Lord has to tell us under five headings. Number one, Characteristics of contemporary times. That's the present days, the time in which we live. The characteristics of contemporary times. Number two, cases of compromise in scripture and today in which we live. Cases of compromise. Number three, causes of compromise. The reasons behind compromise. The thing that happens to people, takes place in people, why they compromise. Number four, consequence of compromise. And number five, caution against compromise. Number one, the characteristics of contemporary times. There is no doubt that we're living in the last days. The signs of our times are clear. The statements of Christ are so obvious for these days. 
The Spirit's express words are so unmistakable that we know they are these words, these statements, these signs are for the days in which we live, are for the last days. And as we read in the scriptures about the characteristics of contemporary times, here are words that shoot out from the Bible to you. Here are words that come out to you from the Bible. Deception. Apostasy. Unbelief. Lukewarmness. Worldliness. Rebellion. Materialism. And occultism. Read about the last days in the Bible. Read the statements of Jesus Christ. Read what the Spirit made Paul the Apostle to tell the church. Read what Peter told the church. And you will see that the characteristics of the days in which we are living, those characteristics are deception, apostasy, unbelief. In fact, Jesus said that false prophets will multiply. There will be, there will be so many false prophets in the passage I just read to you. They are the apostasy. They are the falling away from the truth. They are falling away from the faith. There will be unbelief. That the people will uh, begin to have their attentions uh, diverted into other things. They will be losing faith in the only true God. There will be lukewarmness. The love of many will wax cold to the things of the Lord. To the things that concern sound doctrine. So the things that concern the true gospel, there will be worldliness, the spirit of the age. There will be rebellion. Just before the taking over of the arch rebel, the Antichrist. Just before the greatest opposer to the Lord Jesus Christ that this world had ever seen. Just before this world will see a personality that will be a combination of all the strategy, all the wiles, all the deception, all the wickedness, all the planning, all the militant opposition against God that the world has ever seen. Think about an individual that will combine all the wisdom and all the opposition against God of all the atheists that ever lived on the face of the earth. Of all the opposers of the truth that ever lived on the face of the earth. Of all the people that ran down God in the people that lived in all the world. Think of all the Hitlers. Think of all the Mussolinis. Think of all the people in history that have done a great damage to the Christian cause. Bring all of them together. Pick up their brain. Pick up their antagonism against Christianity. And put all the antagonism in one person's mind and brain. as the Antichrist. And just before the coming of that Antichrist, the wind will be blowing before he comes. The spirit of that age, the spirit of the Antichrist, will already be moving before he comes. And he is soon coming because the rapture will take place at any time. And once the rapture has taken place and the saints have gone, then the Antichrist will be able to operate without any hindrance. And if the Antichrist uh, is going to operate without any hindrance, going to be able to mobilize all the people that are opposers of the true faith and is going to just uh, mobilize people that are opposed, opposed to the real doctrine of the Bible and those people in the world at that time it will be a terrible thing for them before he comes the Bible says the spirit of that antichrist and so many antichrists even now getting ready for him that means then the age in which we live is the age that is marked with rebellion. It's one of the characteristics of the last days. It will be an age marked with materialism. If you have time, you read about Babylon in, um, the, in Revelation. And that is at the time of the tribulation, the great tribulation, after the rapture has taken place. But just before that time, the materialism, one of the dangers of the last days. The materialism that will take over in the minds of the people. And then there will be so much occultism. Public, private. And uh, occultism will so spread, and it's already spread, spread in many parts of the world, that it is part of some normal, what they call normal games. You know, they play games with now occultism. And uh, people are getting involved in all these things because 
these are the characteristics in the age in which we live. Now think about it. If you are surrounded by people, by spirits, by ideas, by ideologies, by programs, by plans, by policies, politics, everything, if you are surrounded by a world that is full of deception, apostasy, unbelief, lukewarmness, worldliness, rebellion, materialism, occultism, you know then there is danger for you. Because of these characteristics, that's why we're sounding the alarm that the age in which we're living is an age when you will guard your loins. You'll put on the breastplate of righteousness. So you'll wear your arm yourself with the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit will be in your hand. And then the love of God will be in your heart. Because these days are perilous days. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. We're reading verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. In the latter times. In the last days. In the days just before the coming of the Lord. Some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits. That's why there will be spread of occultism in the last days. And doctrines of devils. There will be the spread of the doctrines of devils in the last days. These are the characteristics of these days in which we live. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. They know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. This is not the time to slumber. This is not the time to sleep. Because in the last days, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, posters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And in verse 5, having a form of godliness, <coughs> but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. There will be the spread of nominal religion in the last days. Don't you ever think that uh, more churches will not be built? Don't you ever think that more progress will not be held? Don't you think that uh, ecumenism among the churches, of all the churches, of all faiths coming together and uh, nominally saying that we are the church, we are a great body, of uh, believing people, that's what they will say. But then the Bible says in the last days, there will be all these spread of religious activities, religious groups, religious empires that are being built, but they just will have a form of godliness in the last days, but denying the power thereof. There will be more opposition to genuine miracles taking place. There will be more opposition to the power of the gospel that is able to transform a soul. There will be more opposition to the power of the gospel that is able to make a man internally and outwardly holy. Because they will be denying the power thereof. And the Bible says, in those last days, those who live at that time, those who see those things taking place from such contemporary characteristics around them, they should withdraw and they should turn away withdraw themselves. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now you might wonder in the mind of Timothy, when would he think that time is? How will he know the signs of that time? All that Timothy needed to do was to turn back to chapter 3. In chapter 3, it has already been said, they know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And then he had been told in verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5, the signs and the things that will be taking place, that will make him know that those perilous times have come. Come back to that chapter again, chapter 3, verse 2. And see if you can recognize all these things in your community. 
See if you can recognize these things in the religious houses that are called churches in your state, in your community. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Doesn't need any commentary. Men shall be covetous. Men will be boasters. They'll be proud. They'll be blasphemers. They'll rejoice in um, opposing God and uh, being blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. You only need to look at the children today and look at the placards they're carrying and see whether we're in these days or not. And they'll be unthankful. They'll be unholy without natural affection. They'll be truth breakers. They'll be false accusers. Incontinent. They'll be fierce. They'll be violent. They'll be despisers of those that are good. They'll be traitors, whether in the government or in the family or in schools or in societies. They'll be traitors. They'll be heady. They'll be high-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And you'll have a form of godliness. They'll be nominal Christians. They'll be nominal religious people. Now, you can see there that we're in those days right now. This is how Timothy would have known when Paul the Apostle was saying in verse 3, chapter 4, for the time will come. When Timothy began to see all of those things in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3, he knew that the time that Paul talked about, that time had come. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own laws shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, in the last days, there will be popularity of a particular group of preachers. Not all preachers. Not all preachers. Because in the days in which we lay, people will love error so much. They will love false doctrine so much. They will love people that, that, that can tickle their ears, excite their emotions. The people that will make them uh, happy in their evil. They love them so much that they will be getting invitations from all over the world. From all over the world. That's why... You uh, believers, uh, pastors of Deeper Christian Life uh, Bible Church. Be very careful. Know what you are really on about. And understand that um, you're being called here, being called here, being called there. Ah, you say, oh, yes, I love this. Now, what are they calling you for? That they are writing invitations to you is not a surprising thing. But the point is, the Bible already says that these people... They shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, imagine somebody wanting to live a deeper life from one of the states and uh, coming to see me and saying, uh, Brother, uh, I just want you to understand. See me in Lagos saying, You're still my leader, you're still my general superintendent. Only that I believe that I will live deeper life and do another thing. But all the programs I'm going to make, all the things I'm going to preach, everything I'm going to do, I'll come back to you. Because I just love you. I said, brother, there's no way you can love me and hate deeper life. Because my life, my vision, my passion, everything, you bury deeper life, I'm buried with deeper life. You kill deeper life, I'm killed with it. There's no way you can say that, well, I forsake deeper life, but I'm friendly with Brother Kumui. We're the same. We're identical. And uh, it's just unfortunate. I love you too, and I know you love me, but you want me to still be your leader. You want me to still be helpful to you. Let's stay together. Whatever is wrong, let's see how to correct it. Rather than saying, well, I'm living deeper life. I'm going to start that other thing. You see, it's easy to go and start any other thing. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, I'm telling you this. I'm not saying that if somebody lives deeper life and goes to start another ministry, another place, that the people will never get saved. I never, I never can say that. God is the judge of such a person. But as the leader here, we just need to teach you the truth. So don't say, if you know anybody in your state that has led a deeper life and has gone to establish another church, another ministry, uh, well, there's nothing we can do about it. But that doesn't mean that he's going to hell. I don't know. Because I cannot send anybody to heaven, neither can I send somebody to hell. But all we're saying is that if you say that you love the church, you love the body of Christ, then you love the leadership, you love everything together. But because these young people, 
Maybe they receive invitation from this other church, invitation from that other church, and then the, we who are their leaders, state representatives, general superintendents or pastors, oh, we tell them, brother, don't honor every invitation. Stay in church. Stay here. All these invitations they are giving you is deceptive. The people is not that they want the truth. Because we're living in the last days. They have itching ears. They'll keep up teachers to themselves. And um, anywhere I go, where I cannot declare, thus says the law, it will be a waste of time. Now, you cannot compare yourself with me. Now, I'm, I'm the general superintendent, and by virtue of the things that the Lord has done, by virtue of the things that the Lord is still doing. Now, people will invite me to places, and uh, when they invite me to those places, uh, they already know that this is what he stands for. And I already know that this is what I stand for. And when I go there, they know that I am not among their teachers. The teachers they call because they have itching ears. I go there and I tell them the truth. I don't tell them the truth in, in a way as if, if you like, take it. If you like, don't take it. I tell them in such a way that they will want to take it. And so you cannot say, well, after all, the general superintendent himself, we heard that he went to Sri Lanka, he went to this, he went to that. I'm not sure that you can do what I do in those places if you are the chief person at when. Because when I go to places like that, uh, people who know me before, they don't smile at me. They just look at me and they go their way. And I've come to the position to, that I know that I'm representing Christ and I'm representing God. And I'm not looking for friendship. I'm not looking for people that will say, well done. I'm not looking for people that will shake my hands and say, wasn't that a good message? I'm not interested. All I'm interested in is the truth. Because I know that I'm preaching to people who have been influenced and affected by the spirits of the last days. And I go in there and I deliver what God wants me to deliver. I'm not sure that you can go to a faraway land. And then you don't care about anybody shaking your hand. You don't care about anybody talking to you. You don't care about anybody smiling at you. And I don't care for all that. And if you hear that I go to Sri Lanka, if the people come to greet me, fine. If they smile, I smile. If they smiling, it's not going to take any part away from my message. Now, I'm not sure that everybody can do that. And, uh, you know, sometimes you are, they are holding crusades. Now, I can move about. Because, uh, well, because the people want me and because they feel that they want what I have. I went uh, recently to a place and uh, they, they wanted me to sit with the minister on the platform. I did. But then as I was there, I looked at people that they were sitting very near. They didn't want to look my direction. They didn't want to uh, accept that I was even there. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you know, I'm so happy when uh, I make people that don't love the truth angry. I'm so happy that I can stand for the truth and I don't care for friendship or fellowship. All that I want is thus says the Lord. And you see, before you come to that level, if you are a person that is so emotional and sentimental and people don't greet you, it bothers you. People hate you, it bothers you. Or you are, I, I don't care if I'm right there on the platform and somebody mentions my name and he says I'm a bad man, wicked man, I'll just sit down and relax and smile. And if you can't do that, don't honor all these invitations. If all you want is that, you know, they're calling you and they're going to praise you, why are you going out? Stay in your church. Leave that to those of us who are already dead. And our life hid in Christ. And anything you do, it doesn't matter at all, at all, at all. And um, if you told me that you challenged me over there that I stole your members, I'll begin to teach you the Bible right there. You see it as an opportunity. And if you can't do that, why are you honoring all those invitations? Because they will just swallow you up. You'll be assimilated into the system. 
and you'll backslide from the people. Now it says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But then Paul told Timothy, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. In 2 Peter, I'm reading chapter 2. 2 Peter, chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 1 to 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, damnable heresies, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now please, uh, for those of us who are in Lagos, and uh, for those of us in the various states, never, never commit deeper life Bible church to an outside preacher without checking off from the general superintendent. Now in Lagos there, you may meet an, a preacher outside. He's American, he's German, he's a European, he's uh, an Asian, he's an African, he's a militant, powerful, great evangelist in Nigeria. All right, that's fine. God is his uh, judge. God is his Lord. I'm not his Lord, but However good he is, however wonderful he is, please don't commit deeper life as a church to that preacher before you contact the general superintendent. Don't say, oh, our church has open doors. You are such a wonderful preacher. I I'm sure that you can preach in our church. No, you are not sure. You are not sure. You will be disappointed if you do that. As a general superintendent, as a coordinator of the house fellowship, anybody, if you committed deeper than Bible church in Lagos here to an American, to a European, to a German, to anybody, and you, showed, you told the person he will preach if he comes to our church, you'll be surprised that since I, the leader, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the apostle, if you like, in that church, I did not give that go ahead. If the person comes and prepare his message, I'll just say, I'm sorry. I'll prefer an area leader that has not studied theology, but as he's born again. I know his life. I know his marriage. I know his sincerity. I know he's not covetous. I know that he's on his way to heaven. I'll prefer the, out, the area leader to take over the pulpit from me and preach the gospel. Rather than have that man, I don't know where he's coming from. He may preach well, I don't know about his marriage. He may preach well, I don't know the source of his power. He may be healing the sick. I'd like to get near him because I know that healing takes place in various ways. I'd like to make sure that that man is healing the sick on the basis of the name and the stripes of Jesus Christ alone. I don't want to deceive myself. That somebody is opening the eyes of the blind, somebody is getting this done. I want to know that it's not involved with magical books. I want to make sure that it's not involved with depending upon another power. I want to make sure it's not depending on ESP, extrasensitive perception. A man is, uh, you know, using the word of knowledge and he calls them out, he calls them out. That doesn't interest me. In fact, in the meeting I attended recently, all the time that that man was preaching and praying and letting the lame rise, I opened my eyes. You are not going to put me in a bag anywhere. You are not going to bundle me up and deceive me with a miracle anywhere. You are not going to deceive me with the word of knowledge anywhere. I opened my eyes. I wanted to see what they are doing. I wanted to see what is really going on. Because uh, I'm not looking for cheap miracles. I'm not looking for just blind eyes getting opened. So please, please, don't commit deeper life as a church to... An evangelist somewhere, to a preacher somewhere. Well, does that mean that nobody else can preach in our church? Well, I'm not saying that. If we know them, if we know they are standing on the truth, if we know they are living by the truth, if we know them so well that after we have exposed him to our people, our people to him, that they will not do something later that our people will lose their faith and say, uh-uh. If uh, this dynamic man is like this, how is it now he has divorced his wife? That's why we're very, very careful. We're not looking for cheap popularity. We're not looking for any other thing except...
just the will of the Lord and the will of the Lord alone. Now, you are pastors. You know, sometimes uh, we have difficulties with pastors. That they will invite other people to preach. Now, please, all these people that I'm talking about, they may even be better than I am. I don't know. In the sight of God, they may be greater, more acceptable to God than I am. I don't know. All these big, big names we have in Nigeria, maybe they are closer to God than I am. I don't know. But I will only act on what I know. If I don't know that man, if I don't know his moral life, if I don't know his spiritual life, if I don't know his marital life, if all I know is his ability to talk, if all I know is just the outward, advertised uh, type of um, personality, that's not enough for me to bring him to my congregation to come and preach. He can come and listen. He can come and worship. He can come and stay in the fellowship. But before I can bring that man to preach, I will need to know more than his ability to speak. It's not grammar. It's not a theology. It's his life. And I like other people also to use the same yardstick to judge me. I don't, I don't like people that, uh, you know, will just call me and say, come and pray to our church if you don't know me. I don't, uh, I'm not telling them to do something for me, which I'm not willing to do for them. I'm not willing to bring anybody to my own congregation and speak if I don't know him. And I do not expect any other person to bring me to his congregation. If they do it, that's, that's their problem. But I don't expect them to do it. And then bring me over to their congregation when they don't know my life. They don't know whether the woman I'm bringing that is traveling along with me, they don't know whether she is my wife or not. They won't even check up. They won't even check up. It's not their problem to them. If you come with a woman now and then another meeting, you go with another woman again, they won't even check up. I don't like congregations like that. I will just open the doors of their congregation to a preacher without knowing the life of the preacher. And then that means then too that... You as preachers of the gospel, if people are inviting you to come and do this and to come and do that, you should understand why are they inviting you. Is it because you are just one of the prophets, false prophets they are running after? It says in the last days, they shall bring in damnable heresies. Damnable heresies. Uh, now, if you bring in somebody, and then the person you are bringing in, as damnable heresy. For example, uh, somebody who was, who gave me a particular Bible. And this Bible that he gave me, he, he, he printed it, I mean, overseas. And as he said, oh, this Bible is wonderful, this Bible is wonderful. Look at the references, look at this, and I printed it, I did this. And he was talking to me as if, uh, you know, he, he was the person that did all the references, all the concordance and everything, and the index and the study materials inside the Bible. I looked at the Bible. I said that this is uh, Oxford edition of the King James Version. This is... Uh, you know what the Oxford people have put together. Oh yes, he say, you know, nobody actually does it on his own. Uh, you just get permission from these people. I said, that's what I'm saying. He said, he told me a lie. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm not an illiterate. I'm not, uh, I've studied the Bible. I've, I've studied a lot. I've read a lot. And when I pick up a Bible and I just open the inside, I know whether it's coming from Collins or it's coming from the Tyndale, it's coming from this, it's coming from that. Just opening and reading. And then he said, oh yes, we're printing. It's better than Dick, it's better than this. I said, wait a minute, it's not yours, it's Oxford. Oh, he said, yes, it's because I said that's what I'm saying. But since that time, I knew his level of maturity, of sincerity, of understanding. That thing may look small, but I can see it right there. You know, many people don't understand. Many people can't see through the shallowness, the superficiality of people. Just on the surface, the way they operate. And these people eventually will bring in damnable heresy. Somebody gave me a book on, on diet. And um, oh, he said that, uh, you know, this food and this food. And the way he was talking, I said, um, 
But then it said in the Old Testament, you know, God knows a lot of chemistry, a lot of, uh, you know, if uh, there's decomposition on this. I said, wait a minute, are you for Christ or for the Jews? You know, because it was already going in the Jewish dietary laws. Now, if you don't know that, uh, because that man is talking about sanctification, because he's talking about holiness, because he's talking about things that you also talk about, you bring him and he brings damnable heresies into the fellowship. These are the last days. And the dangers are very, very much. That's why you should be very vigilant. Your eyes open, your mind open to the real truth. And it says in verse 2, Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you. Merchandise of you. Uh, Please, I'm not, uh, I don't want to mention names, and I'm avoiding mentioning the names of people, but I have the high respect for the church that I pastor. High, high respect. Great respect for the church I pastor. In fact, they are my very lives, and I do not like any preacher from anywhere to take them for granted. Now, uh, somebody from America had his load of uh, literature at the wall that he wanted to, you know, uh, bring down and then arrange all the things. And then he came to me and because he's known me before and because he feels that uh, I know him to be living right and things like that. And they said, why not make announcement for your church members? After all, there are so many, so that uh, they will help me and do the work of the slave, the work of the servants, and, you know, bring all those things down, tidy this and do this. I said, I'm sorry. Very, very sorry. You know, those people, they are pilgrims on their way to heaven. They are not the messengers and the slaves of an American to come and be uh, offloading books out of a box. You go and get laborers to go and do that. Not the kings in the kingdom. Amen. It's a priests and kings. They may not be educated. They may be literate. I have high regard for those members of the church. And I love them. And I do not want anybody to make merchandise of them. If you have your load in the wall, you go and pay the laborers and let them offload that thing. Not the members of my church. They may be literate, but they are born again. They are kings, they are priests. And I'm not just going to get to my church and make announcements and say, you slaves. No, no, no. I respect those people. I honor those people. They are my very life. And I can't, uh, you know, call them to just go and be doing the work for somebody, for Bible Society of Nigeria, for this one of Cameroon, for this one of Africa. Not at all. Not at all. Well, not that those books are bad. But what I'm saying is that you are not going to make merchandise of the church I belong to. You won't do it. And I'm telling you that in your churches, don't let people make merchandise of the, of the, uh, of the church. Somebody, you know, has come and he wants to build his private personal house, and then all the members of our churches are drafted there to go and do uh, the work of uh, youth, youth coppers. To go and be building his house for him without wages, without money, to make the members of our own church slaves. Slaves. No, slave trade is over. And if it's over, let's forget it. You want to build a house? An American wants to do anything in this country, wants to get anything done. I'm not talking of gospel preaching. I'm not talking of helping people when they want to win souls. I'm not talking of that now. I'm talking of things that are just commercial, commercial, that people want to do. Don't make this church uh, open to people that want to take our love, our simplicity, our holiness, our humility for granted. Now it says, through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I've read all of this to you, my brothers and sisters, to tell you that 
These are the characteristics of contemporary times. We're living in the last days. And if these things uh, don't constitute grave danger, what else do you think will constitute danger? They are dangerous. And these are perilous days. Now, number two, the cases of compromise. Cases of compromise. You know, very often, our unenlightened minds our simple, simplistic attitudes will tell us and assure us that we are so spiritual that we can never compromise again. Or we tell ourselves that we have gone so far, we can never come back. We tell ourselves we have been in the narrow way that leads to heaven for so long and we are so used to the narrow way we can never get to the broad way again. Our minds deceive us like that. We assure ourselves that we have traveled so far. We have already escaped the danger of compromise. Have we not won many battles? We ask ourselves. Have we not so eloquently defended the faith already? We ask ourselves. Have we not studied and taught the doctrine of the Bible so convincingly in the past? We ask ourselves. And then we say, how can we now ever enter or be lured into compromise. It said in First Kings chapter 20. And I'm reading in verse 11. The king of Israel answered and said, Let him tell him, Let him not that girded on his harness boast himself as he that put it all. That is, don't assure yourself that we've gone so far, you know so much, you have done so much, and you have been so close to the Lord, you can never be de deceived, you can never be sidetracked, you can never get into something false again, something phony, something superficial again. Be on your guard. Always be watching. Have all your, to all your senses sharp and prepared and have all your spiritual equipment that are meant to detect error uh, anywhere. Have them in operation so that you will not be fooled. So that you will not be deceived. Because we should not trust now and say, well, there is no danger. There is no danger. Oh no, you must still be watching. Let him know that God is on the earnest the earnest, we are just getting on the earnest, just starting the world, just the church growing. Don't let him boast himself or see that put it each or. Look at these cases of compromise. Because of our time, I'll not be able to read all the references to you, but I'll tell you. Exodus, just write this now. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, then verses 21 to 24. The second reference, Genesis chapter 27, verses 6 to 19. The third reference, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 to 31. Number four, 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 8. Together with Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26. Number 5, 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 1 to 7. Together with chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. 6. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, verses 18 to 36. There are some things I want you to notice in these, in these cases of compromise. In Exodus, chapter 32, it's about Aaron. Now think about Aaron, called of God. Think about Aaron that had stood valiantly with Moses before Pharaoh in Egypt. 
And he was the person that the children of Israel came to. And they got him to compromise on the object of worship. They said, up, make us gods. Because as for this Moses, we what not, we know not what is become of him. And then he made a call for them to worship. If Aaron could compromise after he had seen so many miracles with Moses, after he had faced that um, hellish, callous, wicked emperor of that time, Pharaoh, if he could still compromise after he had seen a lot, the manna falling every day, the Red Sea parted into two, for the children of Israel to pass, to pass through, if he could still compromise after he had seen that by the protection of the blood of the Lamb, the death angel passed over every Israelite, and the firstborn of the house of the Egyptians died. If he could still compromise after that, what do you think of yourself? Oh, that's a case that should warn us that no matter how far we have traveled, no matter how valiantly we have defended the gospel before, no matter how um, dynamic we have been in the preaching of the gospel, in the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord, we should still be on the lookout so that we do not fall and become another case of compromise. In the case of Genesis chapter 27, that was Jacob. God had a Lord. God had a Lord in, a, in plan for Jacob. But then, he yielded to the mother's influence in the area of his peculiar character weakness. Listen to me. Jacob himself had a peculiar character weakness. And you, in all probability, you have a peculiar character weakness. Think about it. Your peculiar weakness, not that you are committing sin, but the tendency, the possibility, the, the thing that is there that all the time you are subduing, you are saying, oh God, oh God, remove this sin. There may be that thing that is peculiar, very, very peculiar to you. It may be money. Now, it doesn't mean that you want to steal. It doesn't mean that you want to uh, do any wrong thing to get the money. It may just be peculiar to you that you have a lot of ideas, you have a lot of vision, you have a lot of goals, you have a lot of things you want to build for the glory of God, and you need a lot of money. And when you are in the world, you are a very clever, not dubious, not cheating, but a very clever person at getting money from people. If they didn't want to give it when you talk to them, they will give it up. It may be a weakness. And then you are a Christian now, you are a preacher now. And there's a lot to do in the church. Beware of that peculiar characteristic of yours, that weakness. Now, in the past, before you were born again, it may be that you, you had this, um, you know, in the world they call it uh, love for women. That as a sinner, without even thinking about it, all these women will be just after you. The moment they see you once, they just get attached to you. Not that maybe you are even committing sin with every one of them. When you are a sinner, but you have that peculiar characteristic in your nature. And now you are a Christian. And if you look well, if you look well, wherever you are, there is still that peculiarity that the women don't find it easy to, they don't find it difficult to relate with you. Just your smile, just your posture, just your standing, just your figure, just your dressing, even though it is casual, it's nothing peculiar, but the peculiarity is on the inside, that uh, you are not committing sin. That peculiar characteristic of yours, which is a weakness, watch it. Now, it may be on pride that you know that peculiarly, long, long ago, you have noticed it in yourself that you just like to shine above every other person wherever you are. And uh, when you are in the world, you might call it uh, any name. They say, well, he's a born leader. That is, anywhere he is, he's just a leader. And he's a born leader. It may just be a peculiar characteristic of pride. And um, anywhere you are, you are, you are not used to being hidden. You are not used to being at the back uh, row. You are not used to taking a back bench. Anywhere you are, you are used to being on the front line. It may be a peculiar characteristic. Now you're a Christian. 
as you are a Christian now, that peculiar characteristic may still be there. Not that you are giving air to it, you are giving chance to it, but the peculiar characteristic may still be hidden there. Now, it may be in the case of um, exaggeration. But, uh, you, in the past, you were a clown, and you were just to make everybody happy. When you were a sinner, the characteristic was there. And uh, in your nature, in your heart, in your attitude, just to make everybody alive, just to wake them up, just to make them not be dull and sluggish and sleepy and dozing like that, that peculiar characteristic might have been there in the past. Now you are a Christian. A peculiar characteristic may still be there. Come back to Jacob. Jacob, from the time he was born, he had a peculiar characteristic. That characteristic did not show up every day. But whenever there was a chance and he didn't watch it, that peculiar characteristic will come up. That's why he got into trouble with Esau. That's the that thing that brought all the problems of his life. The peculiar characteristic. Now there was somebody, the mother, that lent influence to that peculiar characteristic. And said, um, Jacob, come here. Your father has called Esau. And has told him to go and make the Venetian. And has told him to bring that thing and I will bless him. Now listen to me, my son. Go and take me one of the kids. Go and take me one of those goats. And I'm going to make something. And uh, even though Jacob had this peculiar characteristic, it was normally his nature. You will know it's his nature when you, uh, I'll tell you now. Uh, even though it was his nature, but he, he was reserved. He said, I don't like to fool with Isaac. Because that man, his eyes are dim, but if he causes me, if he, if he detects the lie, the deceit, and he causes me, the patriarchs of those days were prophets, their words were decreed. Whatever they said on you, on your children, on your posterity, that was final. And Jacob knew. Jacob knew that that man, although he's my father, <laughs> although that, mommy, I know that you are his wife, but if he uses his God-given covenant authority and he causes me, I'll never be out of it. Oh, the mother said, don't worry about that. Let that come on me. I'm telling you to do it. And Jacob compromised and said, all right, I'm afraid, but since you are saying that there will be no trouble, I will do it. Once he accepted, his nature came, came out. He did it to perfection. That even Isaac, Isaac couldn't tell. He said, the smell of the clothes you are putting on looks like that of Esau. The hand looks like that of Esau. Everything looks like that of Esau. But isn't this the voice of Jacob? But that man acted so well because it was his nature. He, he didn't go to school to learn it. A characteristic is not what you go to school to learn. It's not because you are a graduate. It's not because you have HND. It's not because you are an engineer. It's not because you are a scientist. It's not because you are a principal. A characteristic is something that is inborn. It is there. But the thing is not going to help you in the Christian race. That characteristic was there. Once he accepted, he didn't need any training. He didn't need any instruction. He did it so perfectly well that Isaac said, well, I'm confused. In any case, receive the blessing. You see that? Eventually, and you know, Jacob timed it so well. He timed the discussion. He timed the receiving of the, of the, uh, of the blessing that Esau did not meet him there. That man had the characteristic. It wasn't, those who are trained cannot do it like that man did it. <laughs> those, who are, those who are just went to school to learn it from uh, College of Technology, those who went to the Polytechnic to learn it, Esau will meet them there and beat up their hands <laughs> and blow up their hair. But that man, it was a natural characteristic. It was there already. Now what I'm saying is, watch yourself. In the area of compromise, there are some things that may be peculiar to you. A characteristic with you that you could listen to me. For example, before you were before you were a Christian, you might have been a political figure that will just rise up and 
among in the local government area, whatever they campaign, whatever they say, you can rise up and then bring all those local government area people and talk to them that they must vote for your party. Maybe you're, if you were doing that before. It was natural with you. Nobody taught you about public speaking. Nobody taught you about influencing people. Nobody taught you about crowd control. Nobody taught you about psychology of the mind. But it was natural, characteristic, peculiar. Now you are a Christian. Now you are a child of God. And there is something in the church that you don't understand. There is something in the church you don't agree with. If you are not careful, that peculiar characteristic will come back. Because it's there. You don't need training for it. You are saved, you are sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, but that thing is there. You can just rise up and get the members of the church by that same political means and get them on your side. It's just another campaign. It's, not, it's just another campaign. Peculiar, peculiar characteristics that is a weakness. And when you have a mother, you have a friend, you have a colleague, you have somebody that will influence you in the line of that compromise, you easily get into trouble. Compromise may be on moral standards. Compromise may be on wanting to gain something materialist. Compromise may be on wanting to win over a competitor. Compromise may be in the area of wanting to very quickly achieve your goal. Whatever it is, it will be a great temptation. That's the case of Jacob, number three. The, I read, I, Give you the reference, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 to 31. The whole um, of the ten tribes of Israel was brought to compromise on the worship of the true God because the king told them, It's too much for you to go over to where uh, you are going to worship. It's too far away. Behold your God, O Israel. And he set one in Dan and set one in Bethel. It was a tender appeal to their need of ease. And if you, are, if you are looking for a life of ease, compromise will be so easy for you. If you want to avoid compromise, have a life of sacrifice and self-denial. Let that characterize your consecration in the worship of the only true God. In the case of Solomon, that's 1 Kings chapter 11. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 26, Even he did outlandish women cause to sin. And if outlandish women could cause Solomon's compromise and backsliding, how about you, how about me? We'll talk much on that in the morning. But let me ask you this question before I leave off that area. Are women, are the women who are so influential on you, the women, think about it in your fellowship, are there some women that you can never say no to in your fellowship. That if you are firm and the Zona leaders come to you and the Zona leader says, uh, they say, brother, Zona uh, state representative, I think uh, this is what we must do, this is what we must do. And we think that, um, you know, if we cut off this program because of our people, it looks like they're over labored. Uh, we think that it will be better for our stage. You say, no, 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 this is what we're going to do. That's all right. We're going to obey you because the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you. But uh, that influential woman in the fellowship got wind of it. And then heard that the Zona leaders have gone to our state representative and they have not accepted that issue. Oh, well, okay. Do, uh, what, what do we want from him? Well, we want him to cancel this uh, the programs are too many. It's inconveniencing to the people. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to him for you. And then this woman comes, not because uh, she dresses differently, it's just because that state representative has put his own life in the hands of that lady. Not his wife, not his wife, just in the hands of that lady. And the lady will come and say, uh, Bro, how are you this afternoon? Well, I came on a serious matter. I want you to know that uh, these programs are becoming too many. You feel like that? Why do you feel like that? Well, actually, the people, it's inconveniencing to them. What are you suggesting? I, I think for this period, well, you are the state leader, God will lead you, but uh, I can take the place of God for you. But God will lead you, but I suggest uh, 
because I know the answer already. I know the problem already. I think we should cancel it. I think, okay, okay, we'll cancel it. Any other thing? No, just cancel it. Is that all right? No, yes, that's all right. And he'll, she'll go to the Zona leaders and, uh, you know, tell the Zona leaders, you watch for the announcement. You know, he'll cancel it. He never says no to me. He never, he, that's just my luck in Deep Life Church. Woman. Woman. Well, if those women are here, well, I thank God for you, you are hearing from your leader. That if you are putting the pastor in the box, if you are putting the pastor in the prison, that please, woman, you will open the door of the prison and say, I remove my hand, and open the door of that prison and throw the key into the sea, into the lagoon, and never touch that pastor again. Don't control that pastor. Woman, that's not your place. That's not your ministry. That's not your privilege. Now, there are men that, like Solomon, they don't know how to say no to a woman. And it will lead you into compromise, easy and fast and quick. But when you make up your mind and you are getting your directives from the Lord Almighty, you are getting your, uh, your direction and the planning of the program from the Lord Almighty, it is not that there are so many women that will dribble you here, dribble you there, and you can never say no. And if you are being a state leader like that, a pastor like that, deliberately learn how to say no. Even before you think. The moment that woman comes and says, brother, uh, we're going to do this. Don't think at all. Just by sheer practice. Just to make it part of your life. Just to make you free from compromise before you ever think if that's a woman trying to dictate the program of the church, the program of the ministry to you, the first thing for you to say no. Let her go. Then you can pray on your own. Even if you are going to say yes later, it will not be yes to her, but yes to God. The one that has given you the ministry, the one that has given you the work to do. Of course, if it's your Zona leaders, because they are close to the people. They are the people you have chosen in the direction, by the will of the Lord, to be your eyes in the zones. Of course, when they come to you, don't have the mind of saying no, because these are separate. These are not women that are just trying to have an influence of you. They are, they are not called to have that influence. They are not called to have that ministry. These are zona leaders that are assisting you. Relax. Sit down. Let them talk to you and reason with them and pray with them. If the Lord directs, of course, you are, going to, you are still going to take the final decision, but listen to them. But I'm telling you that compromise will come when the women are so influential upon you that you never can say no. Now think about, I, I wonder, really I seriously wonder, how Solomon could remain a king with 1,000 women influencing him. 1,000 women. Let's read it. First Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11. From verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, of the Amorites, of the Edomites, of the Sidonians, of the Hittites, of the nations concerning the witch, concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had, how many wives? Princes and then, how many concubines? And his wife turned his turned away his heart. How many women in all? One thousand. You know, I wonder how that man. Uh, you know, there are not uh, up to one thousand days in one year. If those women will only take one day, one day of the year and say, okay, I'll be willing to take one day. If there was a good arrangement that, okay, you'll take only one day, there'll be about uh, two, uh, two, day, two women to one day, and there'll still be extra women. You'll be, in fact, you'll be getting up to about three women every day that will say, well, it has come to my turn to have my own influence. Think about it. 
that that man was not free like his father, the psalmist of Israel. The one that had visions far, far, far off. The one that his songs were prophetic. They were songs of praise unto the Lord. And that man that could play on the harp and an evil spirit will vanish away. That man that could go on the battlefield. You read your Bible very well. I don't hear of any time that Solomon went to the battlefield and fighting the, you know, the enemies. No, he just depended on his wisdom. No battle to fight except the battle of the women. I mean, what, 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 battle, what, what other battle can you fight? When they, you know, they are so, uh, 1,000 women, and if you know women, if you know women, if only three women are fighting on one man, that man is miserable. And when 1,000 women are fighting on one man, that man is terrible. Solomon, the wise king of Israel. Well, there we are. If Solomon could compromise because he didn't know how to say no to a woman and to the women, you know, whenever they came, he, he never knew that, you know, people that have, uh, they eat, they don't know when they are satisfied. You know, he saw another woman, he didn't know that already there are 364 in the house. He said, you know, come, I think you look beautiful. He saw another one again, I think I'll take that one too. So another one again, I think I'll take that one too. Uh -huh. You see, you may not be doing that physically, because at least the eyes are watching you. They are not called wives, they are not called concubines, but the same influence they had on Solomon, the same influence they have on you. Listen to me. You say, they don't have any influence like that. Okay, listen. In your own state, deeper like Bible Church is not established in your own village where you are, where you are, your own village. Listen to me. But that lady is also of that same state. And then he, you know, came to you and said, my mother is perishing. She's not got the gospel. Our people, I don't want them to go to Anglican church again. We must go and establish deeper life in my village. In your own village, there is no pastor to even send there. Your own village. Then that woman, you never can say no to that woman. I will say, all right, who do you want and in our village? I want them to really come to the Lord. I want a dynamic person. Who are we going to send? Now, when I suggest I'm the most effective person in the state capital, I think Brasso and so will fit into our village. Okay, okay. And you know you need that assistant. You need that brother, dynamic, effective in that state capital. But how can you say no to this lady now? And you think you are working for God. And then the person will go to that uh, will go to that place. He gets there, and that woman is always going to supervise the work in that village. That's her village, and is coming to report back. Looks like the work is not going. It looks. I think you need to speak to that brother. He's not as dynamic as when he was in the state capital here. I th because uh, my village people they must not perish because Jesus died for them. Uh -huh. Jesus died for those in my village too. Then that preacher will come, uh, the influential woman has spoken to the leader. And then, before the brother gives the report of what is going on, what report is he going to give? The person that knows how to give report has come. Then we lash that individual. That means that that woman is your lord, is your master, is your supervisor, is your controller. Is the one that is actually controlling what you are doing. If your wife is doing it, it is bad. If it's another woman, not your wife, it's a terribly worse. Terrible. Now, there are people that compromise because of all these influences. They don't know how to say no. They don't know how to say no to women in particular. Well, women, uh, don't worry. I mean, I'm sure you are not like I'm talking about. I think the type of people we are talking about, they are back in the stage. They are not here in the conference. And if you are here in the conference, aren't you happy for... <laughs> aren't you happy for a general superintendent who doesn't, uh, who doesn't want you to come and kneel out to him, laughing and saying, brother, that was a good message. I'm sure that when we finish, you'll go back home and cry and say, uh, this man has spoiled my influence on the state leader. If I do that, I praise the Lord. 
Now, it's important that if we're not going to compromise, if we're not going to just give up the gospel and just yield the gospel into the hands of people who don't have any business controlling the church, then we should know that we must not compromise on these areas. Now, these are the areas where women have special interests and special joy. Now, women have a lot of interest in other things, but these are some areas where they have special interest. Number one, ceremonies. That's why they like to influence the church, influence the pastor. Number two, weddings. Number three, house dedication. You know, her husband has just got a new house, and um, she doesn't want you to think about church policy or church principle or church practice. She just wants you to, you know, it's my husband. And God has provided for us. We have built a new house. And uh, pastor, I hope you will be there. We're going to dedicate the house. Women are interested in funerals. Funerals. You know, that's why they like, you know, they like to cook, they like to serve, they like to do all these things. And if it's in particular their relatives that died, they like good funerals. They're also interested in housekeeping. Having a good house, having good apartment. They are also interested in child dedication and naming ceremony. And the women are interested in materialism. Now, if you are not very careful, because these are special interests, interest areas for the women, these are areas they will like to influence you. The doctrine will still be there, the preaching will still be going on. But then, on these ceremonies and weddings and house dedication, and funerals, and housekeeping, and child dedication, and naming ceremony, and uh, materialism, if you are not very careful, it will influence you to the point you cannot say no. Let's look at Solomon once again. First Kings chapter 11, verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wife turned away his heart after other gods. When he was nearer to the grave, that was the time he turned his way, his heart from the Lord. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians. That's where the influence went. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. Now, come back, come back to chapter 1, verse 1, rather. Verse 1. Solomon, King Solomon, loved many women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, of the Ammonites, of the Edomites, of the Sidonians, of the Hittites. Come back to verse, uh, to verse 5. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. You know what happened? Well, the woman that came later, because the daughter of Pharaoh came first, came before the rest. Of the Moabites came before the others. Then after that, the Ammonites. After that, the Edomites. After that, the Sidonians. And all the other women had not told this king to build a you know, shines for their idols. But what are we seeing? The king has already given a commission. He has already approved the plan to build for this woman, the Sidonian. But the other women said, what am I doing? My city, my village, my tribe will also have idols. This woman that has just come recently, influencing Solomon to build. So next, uh, the abomination of the Ammonites. That's the one, the woman that had come before the Sidonians said, uh -uh, Solomon, king, we have been here all these days and we love you. And there is nothing in our area too. That our own idol is at least better than this one. Why not come and do something on our area? Now, how can this king say no when he said yes to the Sidonian that came later? And so he went to worship the abomination. In verse 6, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then Solomon, uh, then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab. You see that? 
uh, if you go back to verse 1, the Moabites. Because the women that came first before the Sidonians, they were now saying, how about mine? How about mine? And then, if you look at verse 7, in the heat that is before Jerusalem, for, and also for Molech, the abomination of the children of who? Of the Ammon. Of Ammon. If you go back to verse 1, these are the people that came before the Sidonians. Now, all the other people also started demanding their own. I'm telling you something. The moment the women in the fellowship, in the church, the moment they know that there is a particular woman you cannot say no to, the other women too, they'll be saying, uh uh, if uh, Esther has uh, that, uh, that influence on the pastor, I think I too should try. They also will be uh, trying to get their own influence. Then you'll become not a man of God, but a man for the women. And women, oh, they'll dribble you. Because uh, little things make them unhappy. Unhappy about, you know, who you choose to lead the chorus. They're unhappy about who you choose to give a message on the marriage. They're happy or they're unhappy about who you choose to be a zona leader. They're unhappy about who you choose to... You know, do this or that. And if, if they know that you are a person that will easily yield to all these influences, oh, they'll be telling you this, they'll be telling you stories. And it appears that they are, only, they are the only people that know what, what is wrong in the fellowship. Tell bearers. But they are telling the tale not just because of wanting to tell tales, it's so that you'll trust in them and they will eventually be influencing you. Now, I give you Second Chronicles chapter 18. That's Jehoshaphat becoming into unhealthy friendship and unscriptural cooperation with Ahab. Friendship and cooperation with men of different conviction, of lower morals, of unsteady principles, of unstable doctrines, will lead you into compromise. It's only a question of time. It's only a matter of time. If you are in friendship, unhealthy friendship, if you are in cooperation, unscriptural cooperation with people like Ahab. You are a child of God, you are a real minister of God, but it's a friendship, cooperation with people of different conviction, of lower morals, of unsteady principles, of unstable doctrine. Within some period, you will be led into compromise. In Acts chapter 21, the ministers um, in uh, Jerusalem, they called Paul. They said, Paul, now you are in Jerusalem. And we have many Jews who will know that you are in town. And they are part that you are teaching against the circumcision. Now, therefore, do this. And then they told him to uh, do the rites and the ceremonies of the Jews. That was compromise. To modify a foundational truth. See the influence of these preachers that essentially will say they were preaching the same thing with Paul, but compromise in modifying this important foundational truth was not something commendable. If you read the whole story later on your own, Paul still got into trouble even with the compromise. Don't compromise on your doctrinal stand on marriage. Don't compromise on modesty of dressing. Don't compromise on sanctification, on restitution. Don't compromise on our stand on nonconformity to the world. Remain where you are. Number three, causes of compromise. Because our time is gone, I'll just give you the points. Causes of compromise. Number one, fear of persecution. That is, uh, people who compromise, they compromise because of this reason, because of this cause. Fear of persecution. Number two, loss of the true perspective. The true perspective is to please God and please God alone. But because you lose that perspective, that's why you compromise. Number three, preference for the men of wealth. Now, if you're looking for men of wealth, if you're looking for men that are influential, if you're looking for... Men that will be able to materially, financially support your ministry, you will eventually be led into compromise. Preference for men of wealth. Number four, desire for quick success. Desire for cheap achievement of man-made goals. 
You have some man-made goals that you are running after. You want to succeed very quickly. You want to build that church very quickly. You want that church to grow very quickly. That desire for quick success, that desire for cheap, achieve, cheap achievement of uh, man-made goals will lead you into compromise. Number five, pride. Inability to accept, inability to identify with what seems to be failure. That will lead you into compromise. And it is pride that you do not want to accept, you do not want to identify with what seems to be failure. And you are saying, no, I'm not meant for failure. Well, watch it. Failure is uh, not something strange. Program may suffer from failure. Uh, particular event may suffer from failure. It's better to fail and then learn from your mistake rather than because you are so proud. You have the inability to accept and to identify with what seems to be failure in planning programs, failure in having enough finance to build a church, failure in mechanical, material, mundane things. If you have inability to accept and identify with what seems to be failure in all these areas, in the achievement of goals and things like that, it will lead into compromise. Number six, influence of pressure groups in the church. In the church, there are always grants of people, small groups or large groups of people, and they put pressure on the pastor, on the state representative. Influence of pressure groups in the church. Those pressure groups are themselves influenced by Satan and self. There are people that judge things carnally by outward appearance only. And if you yield to their influence, you'll eventually compromise. Number seven, the reason, the cause for compromise. Craving for popularity and the praise of men. I'm sure you know that there are people that are looking for cheap popularity. Cheap popularity. They want to be popular. They want to be well-known as great evangelists. Well, eventually, people get to know those who have well-established ministries. Egypt cannot say that they did not know Moses. They knew him, not because of cheap popularity, but because of the things that he did, the things that happened. The Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, they will not say in their records, in their history, that they never heard of Joshua. They heard of him because of the things that happened through his life and his ministry. And the people in Babylon, they will not say that they were ignorant of Daniel, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their popularity did not come out of cheap uh, selling out of their morals. Cheap selling out of the quality of character that they had. Their popularity came as a result of standing for the truth. If you are going to be popular at all, let it be how Moses was popular in, um, in Egypt. Let it be how Joshua was popular among all those seven nations, let it be how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego became popular. Don't crave for cheap popularity and the praise of men. Let it be how Peter became popular in Jerusalem and Palestine. Let it be how Paul became popular in Asia by the things they did, by the ministry that God placed in their hands. That's true popularity. But the cheap popularity that has nothing to offer, has no ministry at all, and, you know, it's just wanting to compromise, compromise with this church, compromise with that church, so that he can be known. These are causes for compromise. Number four, consequence of compromise. Well, I told you because of time, I'll not be giving much explanation on this, but consequence of compromise. Number one, loss of victory. You cannot keep the victory if you compromise. Loss of victory. Number two, loss of God's favor. Loss of God's favor. He cannot know, he can no more remain with you, walk with you, show his love. He cannot, he can no more open the windows of heaven. You lose God's favor. Number one is the loss of victory. You know, in, in Joshua chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. They lost the victory. And Joshua began to find out what happened. 
There was a man that was interested in the Babylonish garment and um, the, the, the gold, the wedge of gold. Then in Second Chronicles chapter 19, just write it down. There's no time to read them now. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Jehoshaphat was rebuked by the prophet because he went to befriend Ahab, an enemy of God. Loss of God's favor. And it says, from now on, the wrath of God is upon him because of what he did. Number three, loss of security and protection. First, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. Loss of security and protection. Number four, loss of ministry. That's what happened to Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 12 to 14, I forced myself to do it. And uh, Samuel said, your kingdom cannot continue. God has found another man better than you are. A loss of ministry. Number five, 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 to 24, loss of life. That's that young prophet that came and uh, prophesied and ministered in the power and the strength of the Lord. And then the Lord had told him not to eat in that place. He compromised. He lost his life. The loss of life. Pay attention. Number one, loss of victory. Number two, loss of God's favor. Number three, loss of security and protection. Number four, loss of ministry. Number three, loss of heaven. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Those who confess me before men, I will confess before the angels of God in heaven. But those who deny me, those who compromise, I will deny before my father and before his holy angels. Laws of heaven. Now, listen to me. How much are you willing to lose by compromise? Are you so unenlightened, so unsteady? Are you so uncommitted? Are you so unloyal to the Lord that you don't care if you lose the victory? You don't care if you lose God's favor? You don't care if you lose security and protection? Or if you lose your whole ministry, eventually lose your life and lose heaven? Compromise is a serious thing. Now, point number five, caution against compromise. Caution against compromise. Saint Mark, Chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 from verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. If thine hand offend thee, if your hand, somebody very close to you, very useful to you, materially and physically as a hand, offend thee, cause you to compromise, cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter into life made than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off, for it is better for thee to, ent to enter halt into life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exalt you and to exalt you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And in Revelation chapter three, Revelation chapter three, verse eleven: Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, 
that no man take thy crown. Hold it fast. All these wonderful doctrines who have been taught in the church, all the policies and the principles that is making the church to grow vibrant and dynamic and spiritual and also in membership, hold all these things fast. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We have been warned, we have been cautioned. Beware of compromise. Let's rise up and pray. Watch your ministry and watch your attitude and watch your character and watch your tendencies and watch your peculiarities so that you will not compromise. There's a lot to lose if you compromise. A lot to lose if you compromise. A lot to lose if you compromise. Beware of compromise. God has called you. Don't let compromise make you to lose your ministry and lose heaven.